Okay, people are starting to... Hi, Frank. <laughs> uh, get here. So we'll give them a few minutes to, to filter in and everything. Um, let's see. Last I checked, there were 46 people who had registered, so which is awesome. I'm very excited. Okay, so it looks to me like there's already... Hi. Hi, Angelica. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Okay, I'm gonna move. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let me look. All right, the chat is already filling up. So <laughs> all for you. Okay, there we go. And now Faith is a co-host, so we're good. Just in case something goes wrong, um, be all set. Okay. So. While we're waiting for other people to join us, um, I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction and talk about a few other things that we have happening. So my name is Mirka Zaplatel, and I am the Director of Education at the McAuliffe Shepherd Discovery Center. Uh, based on the, the people who registered for this, some of you have probably never heard of us before. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that, that we're known as far away as Hawaii, but I'm, I'm not confident necessarily. So we're a space aviation technology and earth science museum in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, our legacy began after the Challenger tragedy to honor Krista McAuliffe. Um, and then after a certain point, people remembered that Alan Shepard was also from New Hampshire. And so we expanded to become the McAuliffe Shepard Discovery Center. And um, so we are a museum. We are the planetarium and our focus in large part is space history, space exploration, technology, aviation, and then also some earth science in there too. Um, and we do a variety of things. So thank you so much for joining us. This is really exciting. And this is our Superstellar Friday event. So the first Friday of every month, we would normally, were it not for a pandemic, be meeting in one of our function rooms to have someone give a presentation on some new research, some technology, some new opportunity, something like that. Um, but since the pandemic, we were completely closed for a while and then reopened partially, we decided to start doing this online instead as a way to uh, keep everybody safe but still be able to have this opportunity to learn about new science and technology um, and hopefully even get it to people who aren't in central New Hampshire. So this is also part of a grant that we received from the If Then Initiative through the or actually through the If Then Initiative from the Lida Hill Philanthropies to really promote the work of women in STEM. And so for the last few events that we've been doing, we've been focusing specifically on women who are involved in STEM and we're continuing that tonight. So we're really excited to have Dr. Samantha Hauser here to talk about her research. Before she starts, I'm just gonna go through a couple of things and thank yous and also heads ups and then give you a little bio on her. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the through the If Then initiative. We also thank uh, New Hampshire Space Grant for their support of the work that we do as well. As I said, we've been doing a bunch of things to kind of highlight women in STEM and also the ability of anyone to do those kinds of things. So right now we actually have a Rube Goldberg machine challenge that we just posted um, last week. And we're challenging people to do the same challenge of the actual contest this year, which was to drop a bar of soap into someone's hands. In my case, it was a stuffed animal because I was the only one there. But um, what we did was we, if you go on our Facebook page and then also at starhop.com in our blog, you'll see some information on Rube Goldberg machines, which are a lot of fun, but really frustrating in all honesty. Um, and you'll learn a little bit of history about that, but also see that we've got a contest going right now through the 13th, where we challenge you to, to design your own set share your video of your machine uh, and a list of the steps with us and we've got different age groups and then the, we have prizes for, of a family membership per age group so that's something you might want to look at we also if you're in the concord area aerospace fest which would normally be in may was postponed it is next saturday 
the 12th. We've moved it all outside under tents instead. So they're going to be a bunch of robotics teams demonstrating their robots. They're going to be a bunch of activities as well to do. The Belmont High School Astronomy Club will be there, Girl Scouts, um, and we'll also be premiering a new planetarium show. So it's free and open to the public if you want to come on by. We're doing all that we can to be safe in terms of wearing masks, sanitation, limiting numbers in certain places, all of those things. But it looks like the weather's going to be good, fingers crossed. So please come join us. We also have a couple of other things happening uh, later this month. Once again, because of the pandemic, originally we were going to celebrate the Hubble's 30th birthday in April, but everything was closed. So we're having a belated party for the Hubble on the 25th. You're welcome to come and see the big image from the 30th anniversary, as well as have some cupcakes and do some activities. And there'll be one final educator-led science event or experience um, at the end of the month on the 27th, more information to come. So that is my spiel right there. I've done it all. And so now I, I just have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Samantha Hauser, who is gonna be talking to us today about her current work. But just to give you a little bit of background, she's from New Jersey, went to Rutgers. She did some pretty amazing stuff with GIS mapping and Bobcats. Then I met her in Louisiana, uh, where she was doing some pretty cool DNA and field work with um, birds that were then endangered, but that has changed, <laughs> depending on who you talk to. Um, and now she is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And she's working with the Hawaiian monk seals, which are also a really cool species. And once again, doing some DNA work. So I'm going to turn it over to her, but just as a reminder for those people who have been here before, or if they ha you haven't, um, the way we're gonna do this is the chat is open and the question and answer is open as well. I'll be monitoring those. And so Sam will stop periodically and ask if there are questions and comments and I'll feed whatever you've put in there to her just to kind of facilitate this. Um, and with the question and answer, if you're watching and you see a question that you have, remember that you can vote for it to kind of get it to the top of the list so that we know it's a really popular question. Um, and with that, I'm going to mute myself and my video for most of the time and I'll just chime in every now and then when Sam takes a break, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Mirka, for that lovely introduction. And thanks to everyone who's come out on a um, Friday evening. That's super awesome of all of you. Um, Mirka, I cannot screen share. You could give me that. Thank you. Not that. Sorry. Technical difficulties. <sighs> there we go. Okay. All right. So yeah, thank you. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about my Hawaiian monk seal research and and goes to all of that. But before I get into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about me as a scientist and kind of my STEM journey. Um, and as Mirka said, I started out uh, doing my undergrad, getting my bachelor's in ecology and natural resources from Rutgers University. Um, and these are kind of just some of the highlights from it. But just to show people who might be interested in STEM, um, some really cool experiences and opportunities that are out there um, for, for people to experience if you're interested or potentially interested in going into wildlife or ecology. So I got to do some really great field-based classes, such as um, these two pictures on the top left, um, in which I got hands-on experience working with shorebirds and black bears through my classes. Um, this picture on the top left is actually a really pivotal day in my career. Um, before this day, I had thought people who really liked birds and wanted to work on birds was kind of weird, um, funnily enough. And then I, I got this hands-on experience handling birds and, and essentially fell in love and 
now ornithology and birds are a huge part of my work. Um, I also got to work all four years in my undergrad on uh, native bees as a lab and field technician. Um, and this was kind of outside of my interest, but I really oh, like. Pam, I'm going to stop you just for a second. Sure. So what I'm seeing is the Hawaiian monk seal conservation genetics. Oh, the slide? Yes. Huh. So it was showing it as if it was one quarter of the screen. Oh, that's so weird. Okay. Um. Oh, now I see you with a bird. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. Um, it wasn't, it was showing up like this for me. So um, this is the slide I was on of, of the highlights of my undergrad at Rutgers. Um, so this top left picture is me being introduced to birds, like I said, and this really great experience, uh, as you can kind of see in that picture, where, uh, I'm, I'm smiling ear to ear. Um, and then the middle picture is the black bear experience that I got um, monitoring and shatter, shadowing a wildlife professional through one of my courses. Um, and then kind of to catch up to where I was at, um, like I said, I was a field and lab technician in a native bee lab. Um, for all four years in my undergrad, which was an, a great experience to broaden um, my opportunities and experience and really branch out of what I typically um, would have done. And as kind of a plug for native bees and a little um, science communication, um, when we're talking about native bees, we're not actually talking about honeybees. There are 4,000 different native bees across the United States, and they're actually quite docile and sweet. Um, you could actually go up to one of these bumblebees on, in this picture on a, a flower and pet its little fuzzy butt and, and they'll be super chill about it. And it's, it's really wonderful. Um, on top of that, um, they're really important for our ecosystem, our food and all of that. Um, and I think they get a bad rap for being aggressive or for bee stings uh, because of the honeybees, which are actually from Europe, um, can be a bit aggressive or we miss identify a wasp as a bee. Um, and so yeah, that's my little plug for native bees and they're great. Um, and, and that experience has obviously taught me a lot and broadened my horizons um, in terms of ecology. I also got a really cool internship in which I got to go to Hawaii and do some aerial photography using drones to work on wetland restoration. Um, and then lastly, the last kind of highlight of my, my undergrad was um, as my senior thesis, I used aerial photography also from drones to identify and quantify how much um, coastal damage there was um, to the wetlands in New Jersey from Superstorm Sandy. And so I do this broad horizon and um, highlights from my undergrad to illustrate how important and how cool it is to seize up as many opportunities and things that maybe you wouldn't necessarily be interested in, um, just to experience new things and explore your interests, especially for those of you who might be interested in STEM or starting out. Um, this is, that's, that's the best piece of advice I could, could give, for sure. Um, after my undergrad, I went to my PhD at University of Louisiana with Mirka, uh, and we got all sorts of specialized classes. I got even more hands-on um, experience through these classes, um, such as all these great pictures here with the hummingbird, um, the golden cheek warbler. I got to work with bats and the kangaroo rat. Um, if you don't know about the kangaroo rat, it's a really cool rodent that actually hops like a kangaroo um, and, and is adorable, of course. Um, so more specialized classes. I also did um, genetics, genetics classes, um, but those aren't as fun to show pictures of, and so you, we're just going to show the cool ones. 
Um, but the majority of my PhD really focused in on my dissertation where I did conservation genetics of this bird, the black cap vireo, which like Mirka said, was endangered during my uh, PhD and kind of in the final year uh, was delisted from the Endangered Species Act um, and considered recovered according to the US Fish and Wildlife. Um, and so what I was looking at um, was looking at movement among populations using genetic resources. And the way that we do that, I'm gonna go into with the Hawaiian monk seal, but the methods are exactly the same um, as I do it with, as I did it with the uh, black cap area. And so now I'm in Milwaukee at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and I'm postdoctoral fellow, which is just a really fancy term for being a research scientist. Um, and I have two main projects, the Hawaiian monk seal stuff that I will be talking to you today, but also I'm working on helping captive breeding programs integrate genomics uh, and genetics into their breeding programs um, to inform and make the best breeding uh, pairs possible so that we, we prevent inbreeding and keep happy and healthy zoo populations. So I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions regarding my STEM journey, um, any advice that people have or, or would like um, from my experiences at least. So there's nothing up so far, um, but I will, I will keep watching for that. Um, and maybe just, I'm sure you'll get to it uh, a little bit, but mm -hmm. could you talk just a little bit about a captive breeding program for anyone who's not entirely sure what that is? Sure, so um, a captive breeding program are, um, when you think of zoos and we have all these animals among them, um, we're trying to, we, we, or the zoos, I should say, I shouldn't say we, um, the zoos will breed animals to keep those populations going. And that has been really pivotal and amazing for conservation in terms of things like the California condor um, and, and bringing them back from extinction. And it's been great for um, reintroduction programs as well. We've, you know, we've recently reintroduced giraffes into Africa or into new parts of Africa through these programs. So um, there's other aspects to zoos than just, you know, going to see them. Excellent. Okay, so we do have some questions now. So Angelica is asking, what other career choices did you consider? Um, so when I was in undergrad, I did consider other things. I was interested in biology kind of broadly. Um, I had always been um, interested in animals and, excuse me, um, animals and nature my whole life. Um, but, but once I got to undergrad, I was still exploring uh, which science I wanted to go into. I was, I was pretty focused on wanting to do science. And I was taking classes and um, kind of the introductory classes. And once I got into my introductory ecology class, that's where I really hit my stride and found my niche. Um, so kind of just what, what worked and made me happy and, and it's all history now. Gotcha. And then uh, we have another question from, it looks like uh, Akimi's S10 phone. Did you skip an MS degree and why? Um, I did skip a master's degree. Um, and partially that was because of advice I had gotten from mentors um, to, to skip. Um, I knew I wanted to do research and a lot of the advice I had gotten, um, which I don't know if, if it's necessarily true, um, but that this is kind of the perspective I had when I was applying was I wanted to go into research. That's what I really liked based off of my internships and those kinds of things. Um, and they basically said, if you wanna go into research, you should just go to a PhD. So that's what I did. Okay. Um, and then Cassie is asking, how can you get so close to birds and hold them? Yeah, so that's a great question. There's definitely different ways to do that depending on what bird um, you're trying to catch. For um, the shorebirds that we we did in that first picture, we actually used cannon nets 
Um, they were out uh, on the beach and we kind of hid behind the dunes, set off um, a cannon net like that literally threw the net on top of them. We rushed all out there and, and grabbed them un from under the net. Um, for the smaller birds like the black vireo, we put up mist nets and these mist nets look like essentially like volleyball nets with very fine netting and um, they're very fine. You can't very see them very well. Like I've gotten caught in my own mist net before. Um, and so you put them between kind of two bushes or two trees or something like that. Um, and the bird flies through and you, and it gets caught in the net and you just take it out. Okay. Um, and then it looks to me like, hold on, there is a hand up. So, uh, Richard, were you going to say, do you have a question? Um, I, I, unmute yourself, I think you need to, to do it. Let's see if I can make this happen. So it's not letting me unmute it. So I think maybe you have to, or try typing it in because I can't get it to work. Um, okay, in the meantime, Brian has a question. What was your favorite experience with an animal? Um, probably the, my favorite one is probably still that, that day on the beach. Um, because it, it had just changed everything so much, you know, it was that first experience holding a bird and, and changed my perspective so much. So it's still one of my absolute favorite days. Okay, cool. And then Jenna's asking, how hard is the math in your field? Yeah, so, um, we're going to get into, um, math actually, not, not really, but, um, how we use math in my field um, in conservation genetics. And I will say like, I was not particularly good at math growing up and wasn't particularly good at it in undergrad. <laughs> uh, I would say I was kind of an average student, maybe above average if I'm nice to myself. So I definitely don't want anyone to think that or think that math should dissuade them from going into science, especially a genetics type field, because sometimes you're not into math because it's not answering a cool question. But um, as you'll see, sometimes math can give you really cool answers. And if it means doing a little bit of math to um, answer conservation questions, you might be motivated to do it and you might, you might like it. Okay. Thank you. So those are all the questions so far, uh, but I'll keep watching uh, for the next break. Okay, cool. All right, so we're gonna go to the start of the show, the Hawaiian monk seal. So this is the Hawaiian monk seal. It is an endangered uh, marine mammal and it is considered the most endangered marine mammal in the United States. Uh, they are endemic to the Hawaiian archipelago. So that means that they um, are only found in the Hawaiian archipelago, nowhere else in the world. There are about 1,400 individuals left, um, most of which are in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, and what I mean by that, if you look at this map on the bottom right, so the main Hawaiian Islands are kind of what you think of when you think of the state of Hawaii. Um, it's kind of the places where people are. Um, but then the archipelago continues upward with these smaller islands and atolls all the way up past Midway. Um, and most of the, the monk seals are found in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Um, where there aren't people really. Um, they're very sensitive to disturbance and, and human interactions. So they, they've done very well where humans aren't. But now there's some in also, also in the main Hawaiian Islands. So if you are in Hawaii or you visit Hawaii, you, you could see some. They're considered kind of philopatric. Um, I'd say 90% of them stay at the same island that they were born at. Um, they're also considered somewhat solitary. Uh, you don't see them in large groups or anything, um, but it's hard to know whether they're not in large groups because they're solitary by nature or because there's just not a lot of them. So um, more research is, is being done towards that. They're also considered generalists in terms of prey. They eat pretty much any kind of fish. Um, and, and yeah. So our conservation story really starts in the 1800s when European colonists got to the Hawaiian Islands and they saw these large monk seals. They're about 300 to 600 pounds and they thought, oh, that looks like a great meal. And so they started hunting them for food. 
And this continued all the way through the 1900s. Um, they were still hunting them, but also World War II happened, and that was not great for monk seals that are very sensitive to disturbance and, and human interactions. And so during World War II, uh, two military bases were set up on Midway and French Frigate Shoals, which are two islands in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Uh, you've probably heard of Midway through the Battle of Midway. Um, so bombings, military activity, and all the things that kind of go with that um, have not been great for the monk seal in general. And through this, all of this, it's kind of left the Hawaiian monk seals with small populations. And these small populations can result in inbreeding depression. Um, and when, in, when animals get inbred, they can't survive as well, they can't um, reproduce as well, and so that um, decreases the population even more um, and increases the risk of, of extinction for the, the species as a whole. Uh, and this is considered or called the extinction vortex. But on top of these small populations, there's a whole suite of Hawaiian monk seal threats that they face. So they face marine debris entanglement. Uh, they get caught up in nets and fishing gear and fishing hooks um, and can get injured from that. There's um, this legacy of um, overfishing in the uh, Hawaiian islands that while the, while the ecosystems are recovering, uh, there's still not enough food to really go around in terms of fish. And so we're seeing a lot of pups starving and having a hard time, um, or, or mom's not able to get pregnant and have pups. Um, you don't have to worry about this guy in the picture. Um, this little pup um, was brought in and rehabbed and released. And because of also the um, overfishing that has happened, there's like I said, not enough food to go around, that sharks have switched from eating fish, or other fish, I guess I should say, um, to eating monk seal pups. And so they're specializing on monk seal pups in the, the um, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. They're also affected um, by infectious diseases that humans have brought with them. Um, they, these are new diseases that they don't have immunity to. Um, one in particular, which is hitting the amongst those pretty hard, is toxoplasmosis, um, which is spread through our cats. We can actually even get it, but the monk seals, um, if they get it, it can often be fatal. Also, habitat loss. So these are kind of what the atolls look like in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, and you can see that the um, sea level is quite high compared to the islands. And so with sea level rise, with climate change, um, losing islands is, or losing habitat is not uncommon. Um, and with storms and hurricanes, we can lose entire islands. Two years ago, a hurricane went through and we lost an entire monk seal uh, island. So it's definitely problematic. Uh, human disturbance on the main Hawaiian Islands. So um, Unfortunately, when monk seals come to rest and loaf on the beach from their uh, hunting, humans tend to get very excited. And I totally understand that I would as well. Um, but we do have to keep because it stresses them out. And instead of resting like they very much need to to recuperate, they'll go back into the ocean. It can also cause moms to kind of run away from the people and leave their pups behind. Um, and essentially abandon them in the process. So definitely a problem, especially in the main Hawaiian Islands. And then lastly, you have this weird issue of male seal aggression in across the islands. So we have a 70% or 70 to 30 male to female ratio in monk seals. So there's way too many males and not enough females as mates. And so males get hopped up on their testosterone and fight over the females. And in the process, they can injure the female or even injure pups in the, it, during their fights. So yeah, there's a lot going on with the monk seals, but I don't want that to seem very sad and overwhelming because there's actually a lot of great conservation work that's being done. 
Um, and this is being done by the Hawaiian Monk Sail Research Team or Research Program um, that is at NOAA in Hawaii and they're a wonderful organization and they work in concert with the Marine Mammal Center, which does a lot of the rehabs. Um, and so I'm gonna get into all of this. Um, so they have habitat protection, like I said, um, there was this legacy of overfishing across the um, Hawaiian Islands, but now we have a national monument for the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, which is helping these ecosystems recover and recuperate um, from these previous um, problems and threats. We're also reducing human seal interactions. So on the main Hawaiian Islands, if a monk seal comes up onto the beach, we have volunteers and NOAA, um, NOAA employees that go off and rope off parts of the beach, put up these great signs to um, keep humans back and prevent any kind of harassment or negative interactions between the monk seals and humans. And so that, that, that way they can rest. We also, have been translocating aggressive males. So if there are too many males on one island, we might go and grab some of them and put them on another island just to avoid um, all the fights that can lead to injuries. Uh, we're also vaccinating wild monk seals um, in terms of a multitude of new diseases that have come out. There is a monk seal rehabilitation and veterinary care. Um, through the Marine Mammal Center, but is facilitated through a network of volunteers that monitor monk seals and, and check how they're doing. So any sick, entangled, hooked, or injured seal is brought into the Marine Mammal Center for rehabilitation. So this monk seal that I showed before um, that was starving and not doing well was brought in and she is now quite fat and healthy through the rehab and veterinary care and was re released into the wild. There's also a lot of research going on in monitoring programs. There's wide ranging monitoring programs across the islands that monitor population numbers and trends. There's ongoing research in terms of the diseases. And then there's genetic research and that's where I come in. So let's say uh, you go to Hawaii, um, but um, all of these kinds of things for helping monk seals apply to general conservation, helping animals in anywhere you are. So if you are in Hawaii um, and you see a seal, especially if it's her, you can call NOAA. They have a Hawaiian monk seal hotline number um, that you can call. And they like to know where the monk seals are in general. So if you just spot one, um, you can tell them. You wanna keep your distance to not stress them out. You don't wanna disturb them and you don't wanna feed them. And these are good rules to keep across all wildlife species. You don't wanna lose your litter, lose or litter your hooks and lines, any fishing gear. You shouldn't really litter in general, but, but especially these things in Hawaii. Uh, you wanna keep the beaches clean. Of course, we all want beaches clean um, for our own use, but also for our ecosystems. And then lastly, we want to keep our cats indoors to prevent the spread of toxoplasmosis. Okay, all right, so I'm going to take another break here um, and we can take some questions. Okay, yes, and we definitely have some. So there are a number of people asking about the sex bias in males and females. And so asking if the sex ratio has always been this skewed or was it more equal in the past? And so then why so many more males, that kind of thing? So the short answer is we don't know why. Um, we haven't been monitoring the populations long enough um, to really know what the pre-human um, and pre-population declines look like. Um, we have some guesses though, which I, I like. So um, females are actually much larger than males. They are about 600 pounds while males are around 400 pounds. So there's, there's quite a big size difference between the two that males are smaller. So it's definitely possible um, that during all that, that huge period of overhunting that humans preferentially hunted the larger animals and they didn't realize that they were just hunting females. Um, so that's kind of our guess. There's also um, kind of some idea that 
the this fighting and injuring the females in the process um, might be maintaining that sex ratio a bit too, um, because they're more likely to get hurt than the males. But yeah. Okay, and then following up kind of on the, then moving the males, um, do the males return to their natal island if they're uh, philopatric? Um, in general, yes. Yeah. So like I said, 90% of monk seals will return to their island. Um, translocated males don't seem to, they seem to like their new area. Um, I think probably because there's more females, so they're staying. Okay, um, then uh, going along with just kind of this exploitation question. So are there estimates of how low the abundance was after the heavy exploitation? Uh, no. So we started monitoring the monk seals in 1950. So we don't know quite how low it got. Um, and, and I'm gonna show some population estimates in a little bit in, um, when we get to kind of my work. Um, but yeah, we don't know how, how small they got and we don't know what kind of decline. We just know that there was a decline, but we speculate that they've always kind of had small populations all along. Okay. Um, so we had some other questions about other aspects. Are there other types of seals in Hawaii beside the monk seal? Uh, no, these are the only seals. Uh, the West Coast has other types of seals and sea lions, but the monk seal is the only seal um, in Hawaii. It's also one of the only three tropical um, seals in the world. So most seals and sea lions and that kind of things are Arctic or temperate. Um, but the three tropical um, seals are all actually all monk seals. So the Hawaiian monk seal, the Mediterranean monk seal, and the now extinct Caribbean monk seal. Okay. Uh, then we have some questions about the health aspect. How are the seals vaccinated? How do they do that? So somehow, so I'm not part of the disease work, um, but I believe that they had um, this is kind of common in wildlife vaccinations. We don't go out and like grab them and shoot, a, give them a, a vaccination in terms of like a shot like you would at, at going to the doctor yourself. Um, we often put the vaccinations in some kind of food or like a jelly or something like that out in the wild where we know they are and they eat it. And that's how we get the vaccination out. Neat. Um, and then going along with the, the health aspect and, and disease. So uh, Nicholas was saying rodents are a known transmission vector for toxoplasmosis in cats. Is there a similar situation with the monk seal? Probably. Um, I don't think we, that we've researched that, but I'm, I would not be surprised if, if that were the case, especially since rats and cats and those kinds of things are definitely huge problems on islands. Okay. Uh, so those are all of the questions for the moment. Cool. Okay. So we're going to get into population genetics and what even is this thing, right? You probably, for most people, they probably have not even heard of this. And if they have, it sounds kind of scary. But what it basically is, is how we figure out how genetically similar and different populations are. And we can ask some those dances. We ask about genetic variation. Are they inbred? Are they doing okay? Uh, what is the reproduction strategy? Um, is it one male and many females like we see um, in like walruses where the one male has a harem of females? Are they monogamous like um, penguins or is it some something in between? Is there movement between the population? So the more similar they are genetically, there's, then there's more movement. Um, and the, the less movement there are, um, the less or the more different the two populations are genetically. We can look at things like seasonal migration, like bird, when birds migrate south and for the winter and north for the summer. And we can figure out if these groups stay together during migration. Do they separate? Are they all kind of mixing? Um, and then another cool question that we're just starting to look at with uh, genomics is, is there local adaptation? Um, and is there kind of evolution at different populations? Sometimes 
one area or one part of the region has some unique environmental thing and those individuals have adapted um, and we can see that in the genetics of them while other parts have not. But regardless of any of these questions or things, it all comes back to us estimating how genetically similar or different our populations. And what we do with population genetics, um, you know, this left side is kind of the math aspect uh, where we quantify how much genetic variation is, we figure out if populations are inbred, we can do paternity or parentage tests, and with that we can estimate reproductive success, how well are they doing. But what's really cool is taking that math and relating it back to the ecology of the species, looking back at things that could affect conservation. So we can relate them to things like predation, um, which predators are affecting them the most. Um, is climate change affecting them or maybe is climate change affecting certain populations and not others? How is human activity affecting them? So for the monk seals, maybe human activity is causing them to do really badly in certain areas and not in others. Um, certain habitat types uh, and how those affect population trends. And then we can determine those mating systems, like I was saying before. And this is the really cool part, I think. So when I was talking about math before and how, you know, sometimes math can seem like a drag and we're not excited about it because of the way it's taught and things like that. But when you can relate it and anchor it to something real world and something you really care about, um, I think it can be really cool and you can like end up actually liking math, which I don't think I ever would have thought growing up. Now you might know some population genetics without even knowing it. So there's things like paternity tests, but also this has kind of become very popular recently, 23andMe, Ancestry DNA. Those kinds of things are population genetics. So for this individual here, um, we can use all that math that I was talking about and figure out where her ancestors came from. We can look at movement across the globe. So we know her ancestors came from, or half of her ancestors came from Northwest Europe. Europe. Um, a quarter of them came from Southeast Asia, a little more than that came from China and so on. And essentially, I do that, but with monk seals. So it's kind of like, instead of 23 and me, it's Hawaiian monk seal and me. So for this monk seal right here, I can figure out where its ancestors have come from. So we can see that half of them, half of its ancestors came from French forget shoals, a quarter came from these, this cluster of islands in the Northwest, 20% um, came from Kauai, um, and then 13% uh, came from um, the big island, Hawaii. But that all kind of makes sense in terms of like the broad aspect of it. But I think there's this TV myth that we've definitely seen through things like CSI, in which someone gets a DNA sample or a swab or hair follicle on my, uh, at a crime scene, they stick it in a tube and, and put it in a machine and like beep, 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 two hours later they have it all sequenced and a match on this DNA database that somehow it just exists. And that's absolutely not true. Um, it's a lot more involved than that, but it's not scary, I promise. It's actually, I think, cooler than that. Um, but if anyone can figure out how to do it in something like two hours, I will be the first one to, to step in line for that. So to go into that, I'm just going to go into kind of a five minute boot camp of genetic lab techniques. Um, I just want to check if there's any questions before I do that. Not at the moment. There okay. was just one comment from, from Ryan going back to the toxoplasmosis that in California, they think for sea otters, it's entering the ocean through sewage. And so anyone flushing cat litter or those rats living in the sewers are part of the problem. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I'm going to go through this kind of boot camp and it's not for us to like learn how to do this or anything. It's more to just show you the lab techniques and the process. Um, and hopefully you think it's cool. I think it's kind of cool, um, but maybe I'm just really nerdy, um, but it's okay if you're nerdy too, I'll, I'll be about it. 
So let's say you get a tissue sample. Um, let's say I have a Hawaiian monk seal tissue sample. We cut that up to and weigh it to make sure we have kind of a consistent amount going in. We put it into um, a solution called the lysis buffer. And what lysis means is to break open cells. So we have these cells, we want to break them open and get to the DNA inside. And that's really this whole process is we get the sample and we rip open those cells. And then we put that open cells into a column with a filter. Um, and that filter is going to attach to the DNA only. Um, and we're going to put in a centrifuge, which spins it kind of like a uh, washing machine. And through that spinning motion, it's going to push the solution through the filter. DNA will attach and everything else in that cell is going to flow through into the bottom part. And then we discard that, we get rid of that stuff, we don't want it. And then we wash that DNA on the filter a few more times in case anything got stuck. So sometimes things can just get stuck, um, even though it's supposed to only attach to the filter. So we wash it a couple more times. Same process though, where we, we put a solution in, um, we put it in the centrifuge, spin it down, everything else flows through, we throw it out and do it again. And that way we have really clean, just DNA on that filter. And then once we're sure everything's nice and clean, we put a solution called an elution buffer. Um, and that buffer or that solution just releases the DNA. There's something about the chemistry of that buffer and that filter that allows that filter to release the DNA. And we do the same sort of thing. We put it in the centrifuge, we spin it down, and then since the DNA is released from the filter, it flows through. And then we have a great final product of a tube with DNA in it. But how do we get from a tube to those cool sequences with A, T, G, C, you know? So sometimes there's some the steps in between, but we're not gonna get into that. We're gonna jump to the cool part of sequencing. So DNA sequencing is really cool, I think, very cool. So basically what we do is we fluorescently dye each DNA base. So there's four DNA bases, um, A, T, G, and C, and that makes up the entire DNA code in your, in your cells. And so we fluorescently dye each one a different color. So A gets red, G gets yellow, C gets blue, and T gets green. And so once all of the DNA is, is dyed, we put in this sequencer machine and a laser reads out those fluorescent dyes in order. So it reads it as green, red, yellow, blue, green, yellow. But putting it through the computer, it translates that color sequence back to the DNA bases. So on the computer screen, we get the proper, proper DNA code. So we get T, A, G, C, T, G, just like we see it in this, um, a diagram on the top left. And you now have sequenced DNA. Now, I know I went through it kind of quickly just to give you an idea of what's going on, but to give you a perspective compared to the kind of the myth of, um, of TV DNA and six type stuff, this takes quite some time. So just that first step I was talking about, about cutting up the tissue takes a day in itself for let's say 90 samples. So if you're doing a lot of samples, it takes a while. And then sequencing can take about a day depending on where you're sending it. And sometimes if you're sending it out to a genomics facility, it takes something like two weeks to a couple months. And so genomics works can definitely take some time and it, it, I still think it's cool and it's super great, but it's definitely not this instantaneous, um, thing that they portray on, on TV. Um, but what's also cool about me showing you this process is if you have done 23andMe or you've done Ancestry DNA, it's the same methods that I just showed you. So now you know kind of the behind the scenes that they have done. Okay, so before I go into my current work on Hawaiian monk seals, I just wanted to see again if there's any questions. 
Uh, yep, we do have a question from Angelica. She's wondering, how do you individually dye the DNA bases? That's a good question. So, so obviously I'm not going through and, and dyeing each one like you would think of like dyeing hair. Um, so we have these kind of what they're, you can think of them as like a probe. So essentially we know the chemical um, structure of each one of these bases and it's a little bit different. So what we do is we find, we attach that dye um, or a fluorescent type of thing to um, a piece of DNA that's going to attach to only um, the T bases and another one with the A bases and, and go on and go forth. Does that make sense? That was the only question. Okay, awesome. Okay, so moving forward, we're gonna to go to their current work with Hawaiian monk seals. All right, so to give you some background of what I'm working on and why I'm working on it. So we have seen range-wide declines in the monk seals. So in about, when we started monitoring them in 1950-ish, we had um, about 900 or so um, adults. That's not counting pups or anything. Um, and so, and this is, this obviously isn't range-wide, but it, it reflects the range-wide declines um, because monitoring has not been range-wide since 1950. So to keep everything equal and stuff, we have these lower counts. But anyway, anyway, so we've seen range-wide declines in the monk seals. Um, since monitoring started until about the 2000s. And you see how things are kind of leveling off. And it's very exciting for monk seal research and conservation. And we want to know why. Why and what is causing this stabilization? Because we want to know exactly what it is and pinpoint that so we can make sure to do it more and, and keep that recovery and conservation uh, success going. And to kind of break that down between the two regions, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, here on the left, the main Hawaiian Islands on, in the middle, and then births in the main Hawaiian Islands on the right. And so if you look at the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, they're decreasing a little bit, um, but in the main Hawaiian Islands, they're increasing quite a bit. It's really exciting, right? And there weren't really many in, there are about like 20 or so, right? In the main Hawaiian Islands, as early or as recent as the 2000. So what is causing this pattern? That's my, my research right now. Is it, um, because we want to know exactly what that is. And we have a few scenarios on what we think might be happening. Um, and so first scenario is that conservation in the main Hawaiian Islands is doing really well. We're being very successful about it, stuff of, um, you know, beach protection, working on reducing toxic plasmosis, keeping humans away, and as a result, populations are increasing. Or scenario two, individuals from the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands are just moving from the Northwest to the main Hawaiian Islands. And so that decrease in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and that increase in the main Hawaiian Islands is just reflecting that movement and there's not actually um, an increase overall. So those are the two kind of scenarios. Um, and so it's gonna be a little bit of participation on your part, although I can't see you, but, but play along at home. Um, which one do you think it is? Do you think it's scenario one, do you, in which it's just Maine Hawaiian Island conservation is great, and so they're increasing? Do you think they're moving from scenario from the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, scenario two? Or do you think it's some kind of combination between the two? And I'm actually gonna see if people can put it in the Q&A what they think, or in the chat if that's okay. I just wanna see what people think based off of, of what I've presented so far. Okay, so we've got a vote for combo of one and two, a vote for two as well. Uh, number two, again. Two with an exclamation point. 
So a very emphatic. Um, is this a trick question? <laughs> Another two. No, I gave three options. It's got to be one of them. Combination. Yeah, two with a, a exclamation point. Another combo. <laughs> this is three. <laughs> Apparently, three is the combination. Maybe. Yeah. Um. A one. Oh, uh, another combo. Um. Two, two. So it is a trick question. <laughs> okay. All right. So it seems like most people saying two or combo. Okay. Okay. So. All right. So the answer is the monk seals are moving to the main islands. We are seeing um, movement from islands, especially from French frigate shoals over to the main Hawaiian islands. And we don't specifically know why, but we have an idea. Um, and that idea is the shark predation. So I alluded to this early on, that sharks have specialized on monk seal pups in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And these pictures show it really well, actually. So if you see these sharks are, oopsies, sharks are, um, beaching themselves to catch and grab some of these baby monk seals, pull them out to sea and eat them. And so what we think might be happening is that individuals are, or moms especially, are moving from these Northwest Hawaiian Islands with all this shark predation pressure um, and moving to the main Hawaiian Islands. And this makes a lot of sense if we kind of if you bear with me with anthropomorphizing this for a second, um, you know, you wouldn't want to raise your kids in a hostile environment where something's trying to eat them, and you know, so you would go to a safer area to raise your kids and that makes a lot of sense. And so I kind of ruined myself there with my, my, uh, my oopsies, but yes, it's also a com, it's a combination. So anyone who said combination, honestly, anyone who said anything was right. Um, so you should all pat yourselves on the back because I had to do a whole bunch of genomics and math to figure this out. And you figured it out with two seconds. So um, it's conservation. It's also conservation within the main islands and specifically Molokai. Um, I see q and is coming in, um, but um, specifically Molokai is doing well. And the reason that Molokai is specifically doing well is because Molokai actually has this really cool sustainable land use practice on it. Um, Native Hawaiians have partnered with the um, Department of Land and Natural Resources there um, to work on keeping beaches clean and preventing pollution and keeping sewage runoff um, and keeping cats indoors and all those kinds of like holistic sustainable land use practices. And even though it's not for the monk seals specifically, the monk seals do really well as, as um, a result of it. Also because of these sustainable land use practices, um, there's really good prey. Uh, there's a really good fishing resource um, nearby Molokai. Um, and again, that wasn't necessarily for the monk seals, but the monk seals are enjoying it nonetheless. Um, but what we really think is, is the reason Molokai is doing well, the Kalapapa National Historical Park. And this National Historical Park was the old leprosy colony on, um, on Molokai. So there aren't a lot of people there and now it's protected. And so um, not many people go there still. And so as a result of this, um, the monk seals have this nice protected beach um, that's kept pretty pristine and there's little human disturbance. So they can pretty much have a refuge um, to raise their pups with in, in kind of some peace. And so Molokai has been this great model of, of how to um, conserve the monk seal well um, and kind of a model that we can adopt and learn from to, to adopt these kind of practices um, on the other main Hawaiian islands. It also illustrates that protecting the monk seals works, you know, giving them an area to rest and recuperate 
works and doing these sustainable things works. And it's really nice when you see conservation success and you see um, all these things that people are doing is actually working out. And so with that kind of optimist, I know I started really kind of sad with the monk seals, but with this, I hope you have a kind of a glimmer of optimistic hope with the monk seals. Um, and with that, I, I'm done kind of introducing all my, my stuff and I'll take any questions. Okay, so we do have uh, some more. First of all, uh, the person who said that it was a trick question said nailed it. So. <laughs> um, but we have some questions yeah. about why was there a smaller decrease in seals in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands compared to the huge increase in seals on the mainland Hawaiian Islands? So, so part of that is um, is a little because these are deceiving um, plots which someone should have yelled at me for. But if you look at the y-axis, um, you see the total abundances, the numbers of seals in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and the main Hawaiian Islands, they're on completely different scales. So um, the Northwest ranges from zero to 1800, um, while the, the main Hawaiian Island is zero to 160. And so, it looks like there's this dramatic increase in Maine Hawaiian Islands, um, but there isn't. So that, that's part of why uh, I think you have that question, but also we know it's a combination. So it's both births in the Maine Hawaiian Islands. So um, they're, they're reproducing more and they're having more babies and they're doing really well. So the populations are increasing. So it's not just that the Northwest Hawaiian Islands are moving or individuals in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands are moving there. So, okay. okay. Uh, we have a question about why is shark predation pressure lower on the main Hawaiian Islands? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think there's less um, sharks in the main Hawaiian Islands. Um, I, this, I don't fully know um, why, but I think that it's because the Galapagos sharks are not near humans, essentially. Um, we have a question about what is their, I'm assuming this is about the, the seals themselves, um, what is their normal home range and how far can they swim for their routine feeding times? Oh, that is a great question. Um, sorry. Um, so I, I don't know, actually. Um, I know it exists, and I don't remember off of the top of my head, unfortunately, in terms of home range. I know they um, they typically will range a little bit farther than just around their island to feed, especially if there's not a lot of food. Um, but they typically feed around um, reef-type areas near the island, so they're not going out into the deep sea at all. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of the question? Um, then talking, yeah, so part was a, a bit was about range and then like the time and distance spent for actual feeding. Yeah, so um, essentially it depends on what part of the year it is. So during, um, during the breeding season, which is basically the summer, um, early or late spring, early summer, they the moms are on the beach a lot more and only feed um, when they need to. Whereas during the rest of the year, they're out in the ocean a lot more. Um, you'll only see them resting. They're not gonna be hanging out on the beach quite as much because, um, because they don't need to and that's, that's kind of dangerous in a way um, to stay on the beach instead of, of feeding. So, um, but during the breeding season, they stay with their pups because their pups can't necessarily swim and they are dependent on their moms for protection and, um, and milk. So yeah, they're, they're definitely on the beaches way more during the summer um, than they are in the, in the fall or the winter, if you can call it that in Hawaii. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so then we have another one that's cut kind of two parts to it. So it says, great talk. It seems like this work combines both big data genetics and spatial considerations in a low number population over time. That seems really hard. How do you handle all of those interdependent variables? 
So um, if you're talking about in terms of um, computers, <laughs> uh, we use a computer cluster. So um, in terms of analyzing all the big spatial and, and genetic data, um, it all needs to go through a big supercomputer cluster. Um, but I'm not doing um, stats necessarily in the way that I think a traditional ecologist does it with kind of linear regressions and those kinds of things. Um, population genetics has its own sort of stats. Um, and so um, we typically use, use population genetic specific stats that give us an idea into these sort of things without kind of getting into the math too much. But I'd be happy to talk about it you know, more separately from this. Okay, because and the second part of that uh, said related, Google says there are machine learning efforts in the larger space, but can you comment on the potential uses here? Sure, um, and I did use machine learning for, um, so we did what are called assignment tests um, for um, figuring out where all the animals were from. So that, that ancestry type thing that I was talking about. And those um, assignment tests, I use machine learning to um, essentially um, create like a standardized, um, what's it called? Standardized like signature of each island or the Northwest Hawaiian Islands versus the main Hawaiian Islands um, and, and then assigned individuals based off of that. Very neat. Uh, we have another question that says, are there ways that robotics or engineering is used with the seals in their conservation slash genetics? Um, so there can be, I, I don't necessarily do. Um, so there are genetic or robots that are used in genetic labs that help with like really high throughput when you have a lot, a lot of samples, um, but they're expensive and Frankly, I'm cheaper <laughs> to do that. Um, and, and often when you're an experienced geneticist, you can beat the robot essentially, so you can be faster than the robot. So it's not necessarily worth spending all the money on. Um, but there are those cool things and they are really cool to watch, um, watch them do it. And it is helpful when you have a lot of samples. I know a lot of fish bio or fish geneticists who have something like 10,000 samples and you know you just can't do all that by yourself so they use robots for that um and then in terms of engineering um i think there are cool things with engineering in terms of people who are on the ground doing conservation in terms of those translocations um of picking up and moving you know 600 pound seals from from midway bringing them to, to Molokai or, or Oahu, right? So there are cool things with that. Um, and I know there's also been cool things where they've put what they call critter cans um, when they're trying to discover where monk seals were feeding and what they were eating on. And they put these kind of cameras on the monk seals and on a harness type thing and, and released monk seals and watched all their videos. So there is some cool stuff with that. That's fantastic. Um, what is the most surprising data you have collected? Hmm. So, um, I was actually a little surprised. I was not surprised that the monk seals were moving from the Northwest Hawaiian Islands to the main Hawaiian Islands, um, as I think a lot of people weren't in this group. Um, but I was surprised about the conservation within the main Juan Islands, just because there are so many threats um, on the main Juan, that are specific to the main Juan Islands, like the disease and the human disturbance, um, getting stuck in fishing lines, those kinds of things um, that I don't think I was expecting quite a, a large signature of, of population increase because we were doing things right. And maybe that's just my <laughs> pessimistic view as kind of a, a conservationist is, is to expect the worst but hope for the best type of thing. Um, we have a, another question. With the decline in population over time, has there been evidence of any bottlenecks in the population genetic? Yeah, so um, this isn't what I'm working on, but um, a collaborator, another monk seal geneticist, 
um, has been working on this um, and they found yeah, a lot of evidence for population or genetic bottlenecks and bottlenecks are just when um, when a population decreases really quickly, um, you can, it, that's called a bottleneck essentially, and um, it can reduce the genetic variation very quickly as well. Um, and so, yeah, we've seen that. We actually think that there's been multiple bottlenecks. They, um, the, actually, what I heard today on a phone, on a Zoom call, was that we think that there was a, an initial bottleneck when Polynesians arrived to Hawaii um, because historically, monk, but, or prehistorically, there were monk seals on the main Hawaiian Islands and then people showed up and monk seals went away. Um, and now they're coming back. So we think there may have been a small one. We don't really know how big or anything like that. When Polynesians, there was definitely a big bottleneck when European colonizers came. Um, and then potentially another one during World War II. Okay, so, um, and then this kind of goes, I think, with that historic or prehistoric uh, aspect. So the islands are pretty isolated. So how do we, so do we know how they came to have a species of seal exclusive to them? Are they genetically more similar to any other seals? So they're, Hawaiian monk seals are most genetically similar to the other monk seals. Um, and that, um, I think we found through kind of fossil records and historical records that the Hawaiian monk seal is most, con or most related to the Mediterranean monk seal and then secondarily to the Mediterranean monk seal. Um, and the way that that all happened, um, research is still being done, but essentially what they think is back when, um, you know, the continents were not, they don't look like they do now. Um, and what we had was, I think, the called the Tethy Sea, which is essentially um, high sea level rise across, you know, the globe and uh, the Atlantic and the Pacific were much more um, connected. And as these things have gotten separated, um, so, so it's essentially one big tropical monk seal conglomerate, right, in, in tropics. And then as um, the Atlantic got cut off from the Pacific, um, each species kind of um, uh, di diverged. So we got the Mediterranean over um, in Europe on the other side of the Atlantic, the Caribbean, and then uh, stuck in the Pacific is the Hawaiian monk seal. Um, do the monk seals get uh, checkups by veterinarians for their different health problems? Um, in a way, there, you know, there's not veterinarians going out um, to check up on all of them. Um, that volunteer network that I was talking about, um, there's a lot of Hawaiian monk seal volunteers that go out and, and just kind of look and check for monk seals. And if they see one that's not doing well, um, or one that's not tagged, for example, they might call the veterinarian or the marine mammal center to come out and check on it and bring it in for rehab. Okay. Um, and if it's a new pup or someone who's not tagged, they'll go out and tag it and do kind of a, um, a little workup on it from the vet. So I think we'll do two more questions. Um, first one, any knowledge of Atlantic seal populations, for example, monitoring program for gray or harbor seals um, at Duck Island and the Island of Shoals in southern Maine? Um, I don't personally. Um, I'm kind of new to the seal world. Um, as I kind of showed, I've been kind of a generalist and I came from birds, but um, I know people are working on harbor seals out there. Um, I just don't know the work very well. Um, and finally, is there critical habitat designation for this endangered species under the Endangered Species Act? Um, so the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands are considered critical habitat designation because that's where the majority of the species um, is. And until about 2000, the entire species was. Um, but more specific than that, I don't think we've designated. Um, and I, I'm, I know that Sam is happy to answer other questions if you have them or if you think of something later on. And I'm happy to facilitate getting people in contact. Um, yeah. But you also see her contact information right there. 
Yes. So that if you if you have a question that you didn't ask, or if you suddenly think of something later and wish you had asked it, um, I'm, I know that she's more than happy to to address any of those as well. Yeah, yeah. Feel free to email me or, or find me. That's my Twitter handle on the bottom right. You can feel free to uh, add me and, and ask me questions or talk science anytime. Absolutely. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for, for having me. Thanks uh, for coming out, us. everybody. Yeah, this is fantastic. Um, I do just want to say for those of you who, who have done this before or this is your first time, you will be getting a uh, follow-up email that will come out tomorrow. And we always ask for feedback, uh, suggestions, comments, things like that. But you'll notice this time, and, and those of you who have been in the last um, the last one in August, got a request as well for um, a link to a feedback form. And this is because of the grant that we got in order to make these things possible. So um, you'll see me asking you to please click on that link and fill out the, the feedback. It really just kind of asks you some questions, not necessarily about this presentation itself, but about awareness of women in STEM as a result uh, of things that you learned and stuff like that. And it's just part of the feedback that we're supposed to be collecting within the terms of the grant. So if you could just take a few minutes to, to complete that feedback form, it would really help us a lot and our end in terms of what we're doing. Um, but I wanna thank all of you for joining us. And Sam, I wanna thank you so much for, for coming from a different time zone even mm -hmm. to, to talk to us about the work that you're doing, which is so cool. Um, and as I said, She's always happy to share. And if I can facilitate in any way, please contact me as well. You can find my contact information at starhop.com or it will be in the email that you guys get tomorrow. So um, thank you so much, especially on a Friday night. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, as I said, uh, it was a fabulous talk. I learned a lot. I did wanna ask one more thing just because I feel like people would be interested in this. How do you collect the DNA? Oh, so for the monk seals, it's actually cool. Um, when they put on the flipper tags, there's a little uh, tissue that comes out and they just have saved it for like 30 years, not knowing what they were going to do with it, but they saved it and thank goodness they did because those are the tissue samples I'm using. That's fantastic. And for all yeah. of us who, who look at freezers full of tissue samples and other things, wondering why in the world they were saved through the years, now we know that there was in fact Yes, please keep them. Yes, that's the reason. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much again, everyone. We really appreciate it. Um, for those of you who, who are normal uh, Super Seller Friday attendees, uh, or for those of you who are new to it, I want to invite you to come to the next one, which will be online again. It'll be the first Friday in October, and we're going to be looking at astronomy that time and more details to come. But everyone have a wonderful evening and a, a wonderful weekend as well. And um, this always feels awkward when I end them, so I'm just going to end it. But thank you very much for, for joining us.